Uh, well, here we are on uh, the final chapter of Tracks and Traces. There is going to be one more meeting uh, in December, but this is our final um, chapter in the book. Uh, we left chapter three, I think it was out, and we're going to come back to that at the end of it with Paul Vidis. He's going to be joining us on the 10th of December. Um, we can pose all our questions that we've been uh, wrestling with over this uh, over this year of engaging with the book. Uh, but it's great uh, uh, for this session to uh, have Laura, uh, who's been joining us at several points um, through, through our engagement with the book. Uh, Laura teaches at the Baptist Seminary in Kentucky. I've got it right. Yes where she te teaches missions uh, and uh, missiology. So uh, I asked her whether she might uh, help us uh, think about this chapter, which Paul writes about mission and liberty. Um, so Laura, over to you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and um, so uh, thank you for this opportunity um, to share some thoughts and questions about this final chapter of Paul Fittis' book, Treks and Traces. Um, good evening to everyone. Good afternoon, Derek. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah. And like, uh, like Andy said, I have been able to be with the group for some of the earlier chapters. Um, and so, you know, it was good to hear that your all's conversation continued to be rich and fruitful um, for the group and, you know, for your uh, various communities. Um, so when I was reading this chapter, I was reminded, especially um, that the overall goal of the book, Trucks and Traces, is um, to support or shore up the living practice of faith, especially for congregations and for the wider fellowships and communions that claim Baptist heritage. And um, so in that framework, one of the questions I have at the outset of this chapter, and I will say, I'm just going to like kind of toss a question in every so often, rather than like have them all at the end. Um, so in the framework, my first question for the group is, in what sense does this final chapter act uh, as a sort of conclusion for the book project as a whole? Does it? Did you see that it did? Did it feel like an addendum to you? I'm very curious about that. Um, and one of the reasons why I had thought about this, is this a conclusion? Um, because Fittis begins this chapter with a large summative claim by Old Testament scholar H. Wheeler Robinson, where Robinson says, uh, quote, the Baptist tabernacle is not always a graceful structure, but at least we may say this of it, that the twin pillars at its door are evangelism and liberty. Uh, Fittis claims at the very beginning um, that uh, of this chapter that evangelism or mission and liberty, they have historically been not at odds with one another, but deeply connected together for Baptists, uh, likely because of the, quote, low degree of class and context from which Baptists have historically come. And yet this chapter, I also was noticing as I was reading it, it is shorter compared to some of the earlier chapters in the book, um, sometimes by several pages. And so I wonder how much of the prior chapter material do we need in order to fill out the ramifications of this last final chapter? Or is there an opportunity for reading this book backwards now? I mean, maybe not like another 10 months in the group. That's not what I mean. But, you know, when we come to a concept here and there in this chapter, uh, we can flip back for a fuller sense of what Fittis might mean. Um, you know, I myself didn't read backward exhaustively, but I did sort of move backward and read again some of the early ch earlier chapters as I was trying to move through this one. Uh, and so I just wonder if you felt the need to do that as well. Um, I would also add, so this month, um, Andy said that I was a professor of Christian mission, and this is true. Um, and so this month in my class, uh, coincidentally, this is the month because it's November. So it's like the last four to six weeks of the term. Um, it's the month for deep theological foundations work in a seminary class that I teach called Foundations in Christian Mission. Um, so just to let you know my trajectory, in my class, we work through, first we work through biblical texts in search of scriptural foundations, and then we walk through historical trajectory of Christian mission, uh, which includes a lot of significant discussion of diversity as cre Christianity spreads across geographic space and historical time, and that therefore is what sets us up in my class for a big discussion about contextual theology and theological foundations of mission. Um, Paul Fittis, again, if I think about this as being a concluding remark uh, in his whole book, um, 
uh, Paul Fettis then would be as a theologian, he's setting up his theological foundations for this chapter uh, with his prior ongoing reflections on especially covenant, covenant between God and God's people and the sacramental practices of baptism and the Lord's Supper, um, and in the conversations about global ecumenism and the expansive, hidden, mysterious uh, act of salvation, a work of salvation. Um, so, and so to me as a mission scholar, even though I do something a little different, um, with, as, with Fittis as a theologian, I just would say that Fittis is not alone or, or unique actually in his trajectory here. Um, I would even posit, so this, I went back, I was like, when was this book published? It's like 2003, right, Andy? Like that's the, yeah. Okay. So it wasn't published even earlier than that. So I would say, um, you know, like, by now, like as he's writing, so his walk towards mission on these theological foundations uh, would be a well-received and understood in several missiological, missiological circles of his time. So the early 2000s, he's very much on pace, uh, especially for those uh, missiologians who have followed other ecumenical mission practitioners and scholars of the 20th century. Um, here I'm thinking about Leslie Newbegin, uh, but also Andrew Walls um, and David Bosch. So just three of them to begin with. Um, but also we could go into Latin America as well with um, into those Latin, uh, Latin American scholars as well over there. Uh, and so the fact that Fittis is walking alongside these missiologi missio missiologists when this book was published back in 2003, um, I would just say that's to his credit. I'm like, I mean that, like, good job, Paul Fittis, way to go. Like, you were where you were supposed to be. Um, because what he was doing then is he's walking with then, like, these developments of a theology of mission uh, during that, pro that era of, you know, late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, that it's continued to stand firm as the theological grounding for mission in this current age, which we're now recognizing is fully an age of global Christianity. So he's kind of in this transition moment between uh, when like in the 70s and the 80s and the early 90s, um, theologians, ecumenical partnerships are really are realizing how big and vast global Christianity is becoming. And it's only continued to like, grow larger exponentially. And so this theology, some of it that Spittus is expressing alongside the other missiologists, it is on pace with trying to make sense of the growth of the church in our place and time as well. Um, so uh, yeah, so I just, good, way to go, way to go, Paul Fittis. Um, Yay. Uh, so I would also, specific to this chapter, I would say that Paul's, uh, Fittis's strengths um, you know, here I think is in the very clear way that Fittis calls uh, for mission to be seen as central to the essence of the church uh, because it is central to the character of the triune God. So here's a just a couple quotes I'm sure we could find even more. Um, so on page 251, uh, Fittis says, quote, the doctrine of the Trinity tells us that the Father eternally sends forth the Son in the ecstatic love of the Spirit which includes the generous sending of the Son in the Incarnation in order to, quote, raise human life into fellowship with the divine life, unquote. Um, so here, Fittis' argument connects mission to the nature of the church's apostolicity as well as its Catholicity. Um, so the logic would go, as mission reflects the unifying fellowship of the triune God in love, uh, mission, therefore, is also a part of the call of the universal church. Um, to act in love. Um, so here, Fittis quotes um, Arminian Orthodox Catholicos Aram the first of Cilicia. Um, there's a lot more in this chapter where he is interacting with um, Eastern Orthodox thinking because the paper was sort of presented. I think in if I could imagine what was going on in that first presentation, it was maybe a little bit more of here's Baptist thoughts on this and where I see connections with um, Eastern Orthodox as a Baptist, putting this in this chapter, I would have really loved more Orthodox theology, like explained to me as the Baptist, you know, like I know that sort of where, where it's going. Um, and I, anyway, so that's one thing I had. Um, anyway, but the, uh, but still, it, it still remains the same. And um, so when Fittis is uh, quoting Aram the first or other people, um, so Fittis, when he considers mission as participation with God as the S of the church, 
This leads him again to consider the nature of covenant together in a new key as the communal sharing of this divine covenant. Um, that too is a uh, mission. Um, and so um, as since we've, he's, as he's rethinking through covenant again, I actually want to go back and bring up a claim that Fittis makes on page eight of his introduction. Um, so I, I did, I did a little bit of reading backwards, right? So I, um, I want to bring up a claim that Fittis makes back in his introduction on the question of identity, um, just as an example of how reading backwards or reading what came before as we read this chapter, I think when we do that, uh, it can raise the theological force of this last chapter. Um, so back on page eight, when Fittis is discussing uh, the confession of the church in response to God's self-revelation, uh, Fittis brings up the matter of, quote, first order theology. What is first order theology uh, and how is it distinct from second order theology? Um, and so first order theology, Fittis says, quote, is thus not the theological works written by Augustine, Luther, Schleiermacher, or even a Karl Barth, but the confession of the church in its worship, its creeds, its preaching, its works of love, and its testimony through individual believers. Um, Fittis then goes on to say, quote, theology will be shaped not only by the experience of the community, but by its confession, quote, uh, unquote. Um, so yeah, so again, first order theology is the community's works of love and its testimony through individual believers. Um, I would encourage us to think about both concepts he names here on page eight, uh, um, uh, meaning that we can then think about both concepts of mission and liberty discussed in this chapter also as first order theological practices. So we could we could discuss and argue about that if you'd like. Um, so I would argue that liberty and mission are therefore in Fittis's uh, claiming they are not merely preconditions for the faith of the church to sprout and grow. Uh, they are themselves first order theological praxis of the church themselves. And this is why they continue to happen as the church happens, especially for the Baptists who have often practiced them together. Um, to work for liberty, for justice, for freedom of conscience, Fittis points out, is a theological act. Um, the same is true for the, quote, missio after dismissio, for example, um, or the benediction after worship. Um, so congregations, therefore, do not cease their theologizing after worship is over. Uh, rather, their theology in worship is transposed into theology in mission and liberty. Um, so pointing these connections and these distinctions out, I think, is a key strength that Fittis' chapter could bring here. Um, and one that makes it returning uh, to again and again um, for refreshed and revitalized imagination for church life together. Um, I'm sure that more work could even be done on this point by tracing Fittis' claims about theological works of love and testimony throughout all of the other chapters of his book. Um, I, you know, uh, I think that there's a lot there. Um, so we mentioned one, but I say that there are some aspects of this chapter I wish just had more in it um, as it stood, and um, maybe you did too. Um, perhaps, for example, one of them is, I will say a, just a disclaimer, perhaps it's because I'm an American um, and a Baptist from the United States. Um, and so therefore the historical Baptists that I study, uh, they seem to have easily incorporated new divinity and great awakening theology akin to uh, uh, Andrew Fuller, so I don't uh, technically uh, historically feel the full danger of hyper-Calvinism um, and what might have been in the century prior. That's, you know, again, it's not, uh, it feels it feels far away to me. Um, but I do appreciate Fittis' interaction uh, with historical Calvinism of this important time for the shaping of Baptist life in terms of mission and evangelism. Uh, I will also say that I did not fully walk with Fittis down the road of his concept of election and the resistibility of grace, uh, which he, quote, talked about as, as the image of a servant God, a God who does not want to force response, but who is humble enough to be rejected, unquote. Um, in part, I don't think I walked as far because I think it's because here's a point where uh, Fittis' other chapters they just seem to have more imagination about the tension between the triune God's sovereignty and also the Trinitarian act of incarnation. Um, 
a servant, humility, and death, like all that together. Um, I did notice that Fittis referenced Bart here about the election of Christ, um, but he won't walk all the way with Bart. Um, I'm sure it is about the resistibility of grace. That's why he's not walking with Bart in um, that entire direction. Um, but again, I did see that in the prior chapter on salvation, uh, Fittis discussed the hidden work of the Holy Spirit and salvation. Uh, but Fittis does not bring up the, sp the Holy Spirit in this section um, again. And so, again, do we need the prior chapter in order to understand this one more fully or, um, you know, not even outside of this book as itself? Um, it, it does make me wonder uh, how Trinitarian must we be when discussing the sovereignty of God? Um, I would argue a lot, very, very much Trinitarian, very, very much, but, you know, um, how and how that works. So um, anyway, and so my last point then is, you know, as I was working through this chapter, and I know I focus more on the mission part of you wanted more discussion about liberty and religious liberty, I'm, I'm sorry, take all the time and argue, you know, discuss, we get to discuss that instead. Uh, but for me, one of the reasons why I sort of stopped here and started to think very carefully um, it's because it seemed to me that if we're going to think about works of love and testimony as first order theology, then this chapter seems to be a very long reflection on what does it mean to practice a first order theology of the sovereignty of God? How do we do that? What does it mean? Um, what kind of concepts are there? Um, especially, again, as practiced in works of love and testimony. As an essential issue, this just continues to claim my attention, um, you know, because I would also see, say, in a sense, the Baptist struggle for liberty of the covenant community um, from state enforced religion, especially, you know, as founded in the rule of God and under the ultimate sovereignty of the creator. Um, this is a different vision of the practice doctrine of the sovereignty of God in the world than what the state religion, statecraft tied to religion was presenting in that historical time, for example. Um, you know, so uh, Fittis' section in this chapter, it says in effect that um, the sovereignty of God enacted as practice must follow the cruciform and free way of the cross and discipleship. Uh, and so when, and just to go back, like when I talk um, about historical foundations of mission with my students, this also comes up in a different sense um, because we ended up studying some of the myriad, like the variety of ways, lots of them that Christians um, have not practiced the sovereignty of God like this in their works of mission. Instead, we have seen mission as domination, as oppression, as manifest destiny, or imperialist assimilation into Western culture, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, again, those are the struggles that, in especially in my class, we sort of bring into theology and contextual theology and theological foundations of mission. Like, they just, this is a thing that must... I think be attended to, um, and and on top of that, I was actually I was met with the Global Baptist Scholars Roundtable last August in in Oxford with several papers happening, um, and Paul Fittis was also present there. And um, this this same issue was and is still current and present among those scholars in the global community um, of missiology as well. Um, and I would say interestingly. Um, at that point in time, um, at least for that, that collected group of 15 people, I'm not talking for the whole world at this moment, but it did seem that which side of the world you came from, where were you in the global uh, geography um, in our space, where you came from mattered for how optimistic or pessimistic you were about Christians ever breaking free from these other practice theologies of God's sovereignty. And instead, our freedom to freedom for choosing a vision for practice like Fittis proposes here in this concluding chapter. So um, anyway, so that's kind of uh, what I brought for you, um, quandaries from the class and quandaries from the book. Um, and uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I hope that we have some good conversation. Yeah. Thank you, Laura, uh, for, yes, um, Opening up this chapter, I think that first question is a great one. What sense does this chapter feel like a conclusion? 
-hmm. in a book that doesn't have any other conclusion I think is is a really interesting one as well as uh, the other places and uh, that idea of reading the book backwards um is yeah yes we haven't got time to do another year reading it backwards but I think it would bring out perhaps a, a variety of insights yeah over to others perhaps taking that question does the does this chapter feel like a conclusion or did it feel just like uh a place to end what would it look like if this chapter had come earlier in the book i think would be something else it ended it feels a bit abrupt to me i've got to say you reach the end and think oh oh it's finished that's it he's done um I mean, leave, but he leaves you on a note of, of mission. I think that's the intention, isn't it? Okay, now, now go and do kind of thing. But yeah, I was, I was looking for something to round it all off, but he doesn't. Perhaps it's deliberate, you know, sending us out. And maybe that's a good note to end on. But uh, yeah, I felt just a bit abrupt. That was all. It's a bit like the ending of Mark's Gospel. And they were afraid and fled. <laughs> yeah, but they didn't say anything. That's clearly not what he's got in mind. <laughs> I think it does remind us that this is a book that I don't know if Paul had in mind or whether someone suggested, hey, bring together some of the work you've done. Uh, it would make sense. Uh, it would probably be the latter. And so, you know, he's threading something together rather than having had a whole book idea in, in, in his mind to write. So, yeah. Yeah. And to which I'm at least very thankful that he even if it's at the end, mission got in. Yeah. Um, it didn't have to. <laughs> like, yes. It often doesn't. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I've got to say, you know, you often hear mission is integral to the life of the church. You know, the church lives by mission. If we're not doing mission, we're not church. I was really, but Paul grounding this in, 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 in God sending the son and we participate in that. Was, oh, yeah. I should have grasped that a long time ago. But he puts, puts it far more clearly for me than I've ever run across anybody else expressing it. So it was a good chapter from that point of view. Mm. I mean, it does definitely read as a sort of culmination of certain threads that we've been talking about throughout the entire book. And so uh, I'm not sure that makes it a, a conclusion of sorts, but it does kind of like, it does build on things that were that were said previously. The number of footnotes here saying, Look at this previous chapter. Uh, I mean, it's probably twice as many times as we've seen other chapters um, that he's sort of drawing things together. Um, yeah, and maybe he see, maybe he intentionally chose the mission chapter as as sort of that in this final spot, even if it isn't intended as a conclusion. It's still kind of this summative, you know, quasi summative kind of chapter in that in that sense. Hmm. Hmm. Can I pick up on something that Laura said about <clears throat> um, not necessarily sharing the same background <laughs> that makes things uh, understandable uh, and ask, really ask uh, uh, Laura and Derek, uh, would this read the same if it was written from an American context or indeed from um, a Baptist in India or South America? Um, yeah, well, so I, like, I think I mentioned, um, so I think one of the other things is that if this was written from an American perspective, I think the Liberty section is one place. So there's the, the thing I mentioned about sort of the Calvinism open versus closed and Derek, you're welcome to like have a different opinion. Like you study different Baptists than I do, but I, you know, I studied the mission minded ones. And so like it's all roses in my camp. Um, but, uh, I think, uh, I, I think that, that on either side, again, with a Baptist in America, um, the 19th century is also a place where Baptists kind of ascended to a type of cultural acceptance. And that then grew into like kind of a cultural dominance in some areas. And so, in the United States, that means we have to be a lot more careful about, um, like, in terms like religious liberty, 
making sure that that doesn't become like a triumph note for Baptists, you know, for example, are also a, like a, a, in the sense that of not like, yay, this happens, but like, yay, Baptists are superior. So I guess a note of superiority. Um, so, and there's other ways in which having uh, some cultural dominance in what we call like the Bible Belt region and like all these other things, again, because it was so, I mean, there's just the spread of like Baptists and also Methodists, but this like evangelical, like this open, free concept, um, you know, as that matured, it it just made a little bit different of a layout, um, you know, so uh, I think we would, I don't be you, Derek, but like, I think, I think more, the danger I think more is of like the, like the, the, if you died tonight paradigm of like Baptist, <laughs> like, like we know exactly how the future works. There is no salvation. There is no mystery. There is no hiddenness. It's all very plain. God's rule is laid out like very clear, especially in the book of Revelation, like that type of Baptist heritage we would need to like work on a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's things that Paul says in earlier chapters and even repeats here about, yeah. you know, making sure the church isn't seen as simply a voluntary society. I think that that is a, an incredibly pressing danger for American Baptists um, and, and certainly not exclusive to American Baptists, but that's sort of what we find ourselves concerned about mostly. And then I would echo what Laura said that the sort of triumph of a certain kind of religious liberty there certainly are Baptist luminaries in the United States throughout our history that have elevated saying this is an American accomplishment, but it's really a Baptist victory, which then makes Baptist sort of a, a quasi established church in some ways, because we invented the thing that made America, America. And so that, that becomes a kind of, uh, and, and then you have the cultural dominance sort of there in certain parts of certain regions as well. Uh, one other thing, and this is not about my context, but I, I wrote it in the margins, and I think it might be related to this question. Uh, 267 at the bottom, this is about, uh, this is, I think, where he does this discussion about, is this where he does it? Yes, yeah, so right before the discussion about proselytism. Uh, in that partial paragraph there at the bottom, he says, Baptists often feel... This is about sort of stealing, you know, people from other Christian groups. Baptists often feel they are misunderstood about their activities here. They will point out that they are not making any negative judgment on the truth and authenticity of the territorial church in question, but simply telling the story of Jesus and giving persons freedom to respond in their own way, prompting, uh, prompted by the Spirit of God. Now, that may actually be what some Baptists think. But I actually know, we know historically that there are Baptists that have not thought that that are in fact making negative judgments on the territorial church. And, and and especially Baptists in the United States have had this, especially in the Southern part of the United States connecting to Roman Catholicism. And so I was an incredibly, I don't know. I, I said maybe now in the margin, uh, I'm not even sure maybe now is entirely accurate, um, but you know, I, I don't, I don't know how, exhaustive of a statement that is that and maybe paul's trying to say something really trying to move forward and talk about proselytism and try to redefine that which i which i actually think where he goes is really helpful but i, I think here you know he maybe glosses over some things that uh i, I think touch on the questions about that stephen has asked about um cultural context shaping how these things are interpreted and also sort of where people are actually coming from um because i like I, say, I, I can definitely tell you that there are living Baptists in the United States who do think that they are trying to save people from they're from a a false church, we could say. Mm. Mm. And I guess that comes back to the context of this chapter. Um, which, you know, every one of these chapters in the whole book is contextual in the sense that it, it wasn't written with a book in mind, but wasn't written for a different occasion. And here he's you know, the uh, it was a paper in pre-conversations with the Orthodox Church with the hope that we might have some official conversations. Uh, we've never had official conversations with the Orthodox. So I guess he's, uh, and we've probably lots of Eastern, Eastern Europeans feeling quite negative about the Orthodox Church. He's trying to say something careful here, perhaps, <laughs> um, uh, in, in, in terms of who, who might be listening. 
Um, and I think that's the interesting thing me a bit here that he he joins mission and liberty together again. You know, the, the liberty is is something that he needs to say um, because um, many Baptists in Eastern Europe and perhaps elsewhere feel um, their liberty is taken away from them largely because of the Orthodox Church in some places. Um, but I also wonder if that the liberty thing is is part of what Paul sees as a distinctive of, of Baptist understanding of mission, which is why he joins them together as well. Um, and, you know, and I think through the book, he uh, through this chapter, a couple of times he footnotes, you know, uh, both and and uh, liberation of theologians. You know, he doesn't really m mention liberation of theology explicitly, but it's there in the footnotes and almost seems to be he sees this as a kind of Baptist liberation of theology of mission going on. Uh, in this chapter. I also thought it was helpful. Um, and I mean, Laura, this is her special, her area more than mine, but I thought the way that he articulated a way for mission to be much more expansive than telling the story of Jesus, as he says, that may not be unique. Um, but I thought it was a very robust account of getting there and, and honestly more robust than even the Baptists that I encounter on a regular basis that want to do those kinds of things. I think generally they make really quick leaps to get there. Um, I think Paul was very robust in how he, are, he sort of connected the dots of theologically why this makes sense, that mission is not just something we might simply call evangelism or evangelization. Tim Ferguson, did you want to come in? Um, yeah, maybe we've moved on slightly. That's it. We can go back. Let, 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 let me try. So, I mean, I, just, what resonated most strongly with me in the in the chapter is the idea on mission rather than on the liberty part when he's talking about um, mission taking the form of community and uh, drawing people into community, which just seems to build on his whole theology of participating in God. And and for me, I just kind of go, you know, yes, in terms of that would be my approach within a church context. Absolutely, that we do community and we draw people into that community and we offer it, and that is drawing people into God. But where I where I'm not quite I, I was struggling with around this idea of him connecting I think sovereignty of the sovereignty of God with mission and liberty, um, and I just we've just been talking about how this is seen in America, and I've just I've, I've never been to the states before until a few weeks ago, and I went to a church it was a Baptist church where I heard shall we say um, a challenging sermon <laughs> regarding the sovereignty of God as it relates to Israel and Palestine just at the moment. We won't go into what that sermon was like. It was a bit of a, anyway, never mind. So how does the sovereignty of God tie into mission? The idea of the, the commands of Christ in the, in the Great Commission, somehow he then links that to, uh, to what? I, I'm worried, I suppose, that the sovereignty of God means that we have a command to be too imperialistic about it, to, to um, you know, commanding in our, in, in, or, or imposing our faith, which is clearly he's not saying. So I just got a little bit confused in that section. If anyone could shed some light, I'd be delighted. Does that, it, it, is the answer to that potentially, I'm thinking off the top of my head, but with the chapter in mind, that, that Paul would say the sovereignty of God is expressed in the servantness of God in Jesus Christ, in the cross Golgotha, in the okay. vulnerability, um, that, that's, yeah. Is that right? James? I, yeah, I, I think I'd agree with that. I'm just thinking about the previous chapters and other stuff he's written where his whole understanding of how God works in the world is this kind of drawing us into these flows of love. It's very attractional. Uh, and very softly softly and he goes out of his way in other places to avoid any idea of god being dominant or god in you know forcing himself on us in any way and so i think he would say um it's been a couple of weeks since i read this chapter um i think he'd say that if our mission is a participation in jesus which itself is reflective of the character of god then our mission should be the same and there should be no imperialism or, or dominance in it And I guess, I, you know, in a longer chapter or a bit larger treatment, it would have been interesting if he had been a bit more explicit about past mission and imperialism, colonialism. He kind of touches on it, but doesn't really name it. But I would have been interested in some some reflections there. Mm -hmm. So Carey has taken as a very positive example. 
but where that all leads in the mission societies and everything else and you know there might be a different way of narrating some of that yes because likewise so he because he also gave the example i can't remember which country was it from was it armenia yeah um where there's really extensive engagement with the uh kind of local authorities in setting up mission and again it sounds absolutely fantastic when you read it but you do wonder where where does it lead with regard to who then uh uh who then oversees who then has um to even use the word authority over what then then emerges quite interesting question Laura, can I ask you a question? What do, what did you make of the conclusion to the conclusion of this concluding chapter, which he yes. describes as mission as di di oh, I'm rubbish at Greek diacona. Uh, uh, so page two seventy onwards, this whole big discussion of uh, um, deacon and and is that helpful? Does that does that land in terms of how other missiologists would talk about? Um. It, Again, I think the orthodox is in the background there. Right. Um, but Yeah, so I think, I actually think um, this is kind of where I wish, one of the places where I, I, it, I like I was tracking with it and I just wanted more because um, I think one of the things that he starts to unpack here um, in the, the, like the, the like the, what is the at role and what is the practice of diaconia in the worship space seems to start to unpack toward the, uh, images of Christ being shared you know to the um, congregation um, and then like opening up into these icons of like Christ's descent into how like I looked up one of these icons and it's a really interesting because it's like it's like Christ with like his hands are like this and he's like holding on to people and like the black door is behind like so you know like there's this black door and I um anyway I just thought um I thought that maybe this was muted because again it's the orthodox audience and they would have seen more in less um but I thought that that again, that was kind of this is one of those moments where I was like, oh, look, there's diakonos and worship and diakonos in the world. And again, we're just we haven't stopped practicing theology. Here we are practicing theology in the world. And he wants to and Fittis wants to see it in a like a diaconal or servant way. Um, but I, you know, and then again, I was just like, can you go back and revisit? the past like you know like when like the 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 like again it's it i think it it also sort of helps that prior conversation in the mission section about what does what would the sovereignty of god look like in the grace offered to the world if it looks like this so there is it would be more of a theological um i don't know if paradox is the right word but you have this this like vindication over death force power you know like that kind of um and then how is that transposed into humble service you know in life and you know um as people are experiencing god um so yeah i just thought this was great and, and then i would have like i was like well, we, you know some of this also means that we think very carefully then about like this is an ongoing practice and what does it do to the practitioner to engage in this type of life. That was another thing. Cause I do think that Eastern, I'm not very, um, I, I don't, I haven't read deeply into Eastern Orthodox theology, but I think their concept of theosis and, you know, um, the ongoing practice, the ongoing worship, I thought that might've been mm. some, a way that Paul Fittis could have gone and it just doesn't appear here. Mm. So that's, that's my, my main is like, I wanted more, um, I think there's potential. I think there's potential where he sees what the the ancient, or you know, just the I don't know if it's ancient, but just the habit we have of deacons being the people that serve over the Lord's Supper. Um, in my congregation, when I was growing up, that was 
that was a sovereignty that was more like of like, we are holier and we get to serve this. But here in this chapter, it's like, um, it, it's, uh, we, we're, we're pretending to, to, to sacrifice like Jesus as the deacon and, and giving you this. And I think that's a different, hmm. um, that's different than I've ever imagined any deacon in my congregation in my entire life. So it's, I think what struck me was uh, reading this chapter um, after uh, uh, a talk that at least Stephen Copson and I heard last week, yeah. which which looked at the British order of deaconesses with a, mm -hmm. with a subtitle, A History Hidden in Plain Sight. Uh, what would have been really interesting here, I just suddenly, I don't know what, Stephen, if you made any connection with that as well. What would have been here, we'd be, he'd be mentioned something about this deaconess movement, which operated in uh, the UK um, for 70 odd years, um, which I think was a real expression expression of mission and liberty. And, mm -hmm. and the, the talk last week is, we, we've we forgotten completely that history, as we yeah. often do with, with women's history. Um, and what would it have been if he had drawn into it here? I just was where I was kind of, oh, Paul, you could have done some footnotes here at least um, and highlighted something maybe, but yeah. yeah just to echo what Laura said, I, I my feeling reading this bit was, yeah, I, I can see the connections you're making, Paul, but I'm not sure that's a connection that most Baptists would make. Um, a whole understanding of, Lord's Supper, generally speaking, in churches, I'm not sure it leads us to this place. Um, I was also struck that um, in similar com ecumenical conversations with Catholic churches, he makes a big deal of the ministers being like the Catholic bishop and therefore being a source of unity and communion. And so it feels like we're, we're just switching the imagery depending on who he's talking to at any given time. <laughs> but that, that might be too cynical a reading of what he's doing here. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong, of course. I mean, it's helpful in some ways, but it did make me laugh this bit. But I guess that takes us back to um, when we looked at the ecumenical chapter and Stephen Harmon's kind of saying this whole book is ecumenical. And he's, you know, um, those that what he says here about the Lord's Supper, again, with Laura's thing, we need to read backwards into the into the earlier chapter on the Lord's Supper, where, again, he's made he is making an argument there of, of, of mission coming out of out of the coming out of sharing at the table. Yeah. Gareth, did you want to? It, it it just seemed a very strange conclusion. It um it didn't really tie up the themes, and going back to something that I said earlier, I think that um you know you know this should have really come before chapter nine and then brought the two together, uh, and that would have been a more a more rounded. But then one understands that this is not the way the book was written. Uh, but rather a gathering together. Um, it um, it j just seemed a bit strange. Mm. It, it, yeah, if you've read, um, there's a book, I can't remember what it's called now, um, oh, by John Flett, where he, he argues that mission is often the second step. We do everything else, then we then we come to mission. I wonder if again that there's a danger of that going on in this book. You know, we, you know, we, you know, it's good that he talks about mission, but really, perhaps it should have been chapter four or five, and then, and then that would have shaped, and and maybe actually that's more Baptist, because Baptists have been such a missionary evangelistic, which he said he says in this chapter. You know, it's it's part of their essence, but you've left it as chapter eleven, perhaps. And what would it meant if it had been, you know, the chapter after church? But the, you know, that goes back, Andy, to what you were saying. It's <clears throat> who defines what mission is. That mission to a Greek Orthodox person will look considerably different to uh, to someone who is less than one percent of the population. Hmm. Yeah, James. I, I I was thinking about Flett's book as well when Laura was talking about mission as first order theology, and wondering is that what Paul's doing here, regardless of the placement of the chapter in the book but trying to make mission just a part of who we are and what we do alongside worship and prayer and everything else. Um, uh, I don't know if that's a connection you would draw, Laura, if you're familiar with Flett's work. I, I'm i not, yeah. Um, what, yeah, I'd love to, to love to look into that. I don't, I'm not familiar with that person at all. Um, 
Yeah. I think though, um, you know, the, it's, it's, it's just curious to me. Again, I, maybe I just like walk in with a little chip on my shoulder for being the mission professor. So like, I've just been trained to feel like, a, what is it the, on the second step? Like just the second step kid, like David Bosch, we're like, just going to go be gadflies in the house of theology, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, so maybe I see too much like sometimes, but I think that's why, um, you know, uh, when I, like, I'm, again, I'm glad that it, this type of chapter is in this book, even if it's chapter 11. I, I too, uh, Gareth, I, it makes more sense to me to be closer to the ecumenical chapter and, or the other chapter about baptism and Lord's Supper. If we're going to see this as a first order practice, maybe I would group it a little closer to them. Um, uh, I don't know. He did put it close to the salvation chapter. Those themes, salvation and mission seem to be like close together a lot too but um it's it's not just paul fittis though like when we did mcclendon um and all of his books um you know mcclendon will touch on these things like practice theology is like his first book in ethics and then like his very first chapter is on eschatology which is like classically like that's that is key content for mission because that also that's the rule of God. That's another way of talking about the sovereignty of God is, is like, what is the final state of redemption? You know, all of that, and, you know, in his key. And yet again, the chapter on mission is like chapter nine or 10 of the third volume. I mean, it's like mm. way, way, way in the back. Um, even though the concepts necessary or that, or even the concept that mission has been pushing theologians to address they're happening way like much farther in front um, of there. But but that's where I think your 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 comment of if we read the book backwards mm -hmm. would be really interesting because this isn't you know uh, and so reading the book forwards, what's the theme that threads all the chapters together? It's covenant, which comes back again here. But actually, what would it mean to read the whole book as a mission theology? um and and you know when paul talked obviously he does it in the lord's supper chapter um but what would it mean to to go back to the covenant chapter the, the chapter on ecclesiology even the chapter on baptism i think there is and james i don't know what you think here having read all the corpus um paul Fitter's corpus as well is paul is always very open to the world i think in a way that actually not many theologians are you know he wants to, he wants to engage with the world he wants the world to shape the church and and, and theology. Um, so there is a kind of open openness, might be the other word, you know, to talk about open to the world. Um, yeah, I, I think that's the really interesting thing to read it backwards. Is, is there more in the whole book if we read it as as as, as something about mission than than we than we might have noticed, and oh, or we would have read it differently if it had come earlier. We would have seen the whole book always pushing us towards being open to the world, to the mission of God, to the world, um, in a way that by being the last chapter, it's, it's yeah. Do you think um, he's writing to the British church, the Baptist church primarily, or certainly out of that context, but also to the British Baptist church, I suppose. Do you think there's any sense that the book follows the shape of the Declaration of Principle? Uh, it, it could do, although... How, how how many British Baptists will have read Tracks and Traces? I think uh, the number could be quite small. Um, uh, I'm only yeah, thinking that it kind of ending on mission, on starting with more about yeah. governance within the church and moving on to baptism and Eucharist in the middle. Yeah. Possibly. Yeah. I guess it, it would have been interesting if Paul had done a kind of conclusion to the book, which has said, look, this is the way, this is the reason why the chapters are ordered as they are, and this is how I see them all linking together and um, yeah. But I guess he leaves that for us to do ourselves, which is always. Or, yeah. or you could ask him next month. Well, we, we, we could, we could. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. is, is there a particular, you know, what was, what was in your head when you ordered the chapters in the way that you have? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm.
I guess quickly, you know, when you went back to chapter, the, the page eight, where you talk about what he says here, the confession of the church and its worship, its creed, its preaching, its works of love and its testimony. Um, it, it, he could have said um, it's preaching, it's mission, it's working for liberty. He doesn't there. And again, you know, if this was the whole, how, you know, it's it's that would have tied everything together. You, you know, you, you've gone back and said, oh, this is this is first order. But I don't think he makes that explicit, really. No. Well, and it's it's not explicit. It's, it's very. Um, I think maybe I was reading the book. I'm, that is a bit of reading the book backwards. I think like because there are ways that if you read it, if you read that list through the first time, all of that could be done within an enclosed communion. Commu you know, a, you know, you could do works of love internal to the church. You could do, like, I mean, testimony inside. Um, but um, but those are also things that can be open to the world in acts of like mission and liberty and um, you know, I mean, so, so it's it's there's so yeah. So I mean, I, you know, I think I it, I maybe if if fitness doesn't want to walk that way, then that means I'm just like pushing fittest in a direction I want him to go um but but to me I think that's when I was reading again reading backwards I was like well there they are we're here we are in the works of love chapter um because he's discussing mission and covenant as issuing and participation in God's work of love in the world I mean that is here he's defining God's work of love mm -hmm. as mission and so would that not be what he has to say, like what he's mentioning in the the identity chapter. Mm -hmm. So that mission is a part of our identity in that way as essential to the church. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's, I, I stand on what I claim here. It's just whether or not yeah. Paul meant it when he wrote chapter one, I'm just going to say, that's what happens. <laughs> like, like, mm -hmm. Because it was it was so big in my mind that I was like looking for it all over again in the last chapter. I was like, when does he talk about it as first order? When does he talk about it? And I was like, oh wait, nope, that's not tech. Like it's everything he says about first order theology except those terms. Mm -hmm. They're not in this last chapter. To so go back to chapter mm -hmm. one when he's setting down those parameters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I just like that idea. I think because you know, there's if mission can also be a first order practice of the church then we can like not have this tension between what is the primary importance in the christian's life is it worship or is it service like who cares like it's it's different orders you know different i mean sorry different modes of theology we're, we're all in theological practice in those way in those moments um yeah it's all a part of the identity of the church and for me that's the beauty of the participating in god image isn't it that uh, these things are inherent in our participating in god worship and mission that, that's what that's what i do like about the theology that's presented in here mm -hmm. I still have a question. Is it helpful the way that he draw, he joins mission and liberty together? And and I guess the liberty in one sense is, you know, we're going back to the first chapter. This is all the introduction. This, the, the liberty is the track. What have Baptists always been about? They've always been about liberty. And mm -hmm. he's kind of taken it now into, um, well, how does this talk about? What does this mean now? Is it helpful to see mission as a means of liberty or um you know i think we've we've touched on some of the problems with that potentially um should we talk about mission as something else or is, is liberty and freedom a helpful um concept practice <laughs> 
I think it's important that the mission is tied to liberty uh, because we want to be very clear that we are not imposing control on people. He talks at the beginning of the book about, you know, we, we follow a rule which liberates from the rule of law, the rule of man, I forget which it is yeah. now. But actually, we are, we are about setting people free, not assuming power over them. So I think the, the emphasis on liberty alongside mission is one which I warmly welcome. Yeah. And so maybe maybe that is just that's 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 the thing that Paul's offering here. Maybe there's not enough emphasis and other understandings of mission with with that idea of liberty. Well, a particular account of mission too, right? I think that's that's key. So we can think of other accounts of mission that, when joined to liberty, will will be precisely become those dominative, oppressive modes that we've been concerned about all all the whole time, but. His particular account, uh, I think, allows liberty to to flourish in this way. I think I agree with Tim. I, it, it does um, it does make me feel very positive about mission to link it to liberty, so that it is not in any way dominating bringing people into the freedom of God. But there was just on the very final page, there was just the phrase, um, the story of Jesus can only be accompanied by humble pleading. And I, I haven't quite, I, I, so I only finished the chapter just this evening. So <laughs> that was the kind of almost the last thing I read, you know, about like 20 minutes before we came on the call. And I just thought, oh, am I happy with that, that phrase, humble pleading? I'm just wondering how that relates to liberty. I haven't quite got my head around that one yet. Maybe yeah, but I'm not sure about the phrase humble pleading, but I like the way Paul in his letters talks about we, we are indebted to you, we, we, are, we are slaves to, to you, very much, you know, we are, we're putting ourselves down as a way of exalting you, not at all assuming control. And I think that's what Paul is perhaps tapping into, the, the humble mm -hmm. pleading. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't associate with that phrase, but I think it's that position of powerlessness that I think he wants to, us like to identify with. Yeah. Yeah, I really want now, like this whole chapter made me want, again, more. I want more of Paul Fittis. How, what is the word humility to him? Because I think is this like, um, and also pleading. Yeah, that was, that I thought, so thought that was a pretty curious term. Um, but uh, yeah, I would say I, I do like these two together. I do, I don't know that I always think that I think they all, for some reason, ought to be linked together, but that's maybe more because um, uh, maybe, again, maybe it's just this cultural moment, liberty can keep mission in line. Um, you know, I think he does kind of, that's why I might do, do it, uh, talk about a second, and then this is the final, like the final couple chapters, and again, back to service, is because sort of liberty... Um, provides uh um yeah like provides some some handholds for where mission ought to go um however though one place we could walk with him is that some of the people he mentions as being champions of liberty have been like actual champions of like social liberty you know, like bringing people material relief and more like social um you know, welfare, like true freedom, rather than being sort of second class or in bondage um, of slavery, for example. So, like, I think there's force in liberty, not just to restrain, but also some type of, um, yeah, like there's a, there's a, like, a, a, not a oppressive force, but like a force towards spreading liberty um, that maybe seems akin um uh to mission as well mm. i don't know mm -hmm. i guess one of the things that, that i appreciate in the chapter is the uh, the ecological notes that he makes at particular places again thinking this is 1997 the paper was first given he might have revised them and added them in when he came to put it together in 2002 2003 
but they're there and you know uh so he ends into a promise that is promised to the whole of creation um i think that's something that's um i'm not sure is always baptist would always make those kind of notes and connections and i, I think it's important that it's there and obviously that mention of creation if we read it backwards takes us back to the chapter on baptism and creation um and what what links could we then make again you know with laura's encouragement to read backwards i think would be um uh, would be really interesting again yeah i i, I just I, wonder okay I, I just wonder that bringing together the question of mission and liberty isn't there a good um an, an underlying uh, um reference to that in luke 4 where jesus uses that passage from isaiah which surely links his mission into the world he's sending by god and to set at liberty those who are um, imprisoned those who are bound in all sorts of ways um i'd just like to say one last thing i have just finished reading for i think probably a second or maybe the third time over a long time paul's book on participating in god uh, and i think a lot of the issues that he puts into that chapter um participating in god i think brings out so many of those connections and that emphasis upon mission in, is about making relationships in the church and as we make those relationships with one another in our in our church communities that then surely is a, 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 a i'm getting old and i can't think of words so <laughs> you, um that surely is the motivation that's i, I much prefer another word that's what sends us out in mission those relationships that we can make that we then want to go out and share and that's participating in both mission that's sending and also in sharing what we see as that liberty in christ sort of incarnating that in our relationships with other people mm. yeah mm. thank you brian yeah i, I you know for, for me paul is at his best on the on, on the top of page 254 when you know i think this is if we could take this on board and this is where i want more of paul again mission will thus be concerned with making relations at every level of the world in reflection of the triune god i'm not sure about the inflection of the in reflection of the triune god bit but anyway it will offer prophetic criticism of competitive individualism in society and seek to encourage political and economic policies that are committed to interpersonal relationships it will also have a care for the whole natural creation seeking to foster organic relations between all animal and plant life in partnership with humanity and beyond i think that's that's a just a brilliant couple of sentences of, of encapsulating um what mission is but perhaps not what we always think mission is um, and, it, and it comes off the back of Tim, where you were talking about, you know, it's about being a community for the sake of community. Um, yeah, I, I, I think I, that's one of my favourite Paul Fittis's paragraphs. But it would be lovely for him to actually unpack that a little bit more for me, you know, the political ramifications of mission there um, that he's kind of hinting at. Mm. It is an amazing paragraph, isn't it? I'm going to quote some of it at our church meeting on Wednesday. I think it's superb. <laughs> yeah well thank you everyone um i do hope you'll be able to come back um on the 10th of december so it's the second sunday in the month because i was conscious that people might be a bit more busy on the third sunday as it gets closer to christmas um paul will be joining us mm -hmm.